Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Saintly Guides Through Lent and Easter. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heidi Bussey, editor of Give Us This Day. With us today is Robert Ellsberg, author of The Blessed Among Us, essays that you find throughout Give Us This Day. Robert is also the publisher of Orbis Books, and he is the author of several titles many of them about saints and saintly witnesses, including Blessed Among Us, Day by Day with Saintly Witnesses, which is available through Liturgical Press. Welcome, Robert. We're really thrilled that you're here with us today. Before we begin, I have a few announcements, a few housekeeping items. Um, this conversation is being recorded and we will share a link with you via email as soon as it is available. Um, you will also find a link to the recording on the Give Us This Day Facebook page within the next couple of days. Feel free to tell others about this in case they missed the opportunity to attend live this afternoon. All participants are in listen-only mode, so your cameras and your microphones have been turned off. If you have questions, and we hope you do throughout Robert's um, presentation, Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom there, at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask any questions. And we'll be curating those and I'll hope at the end we'll save time and I'll hope to get through as many as I can asking Robert um, your questions. So Robert, um, I know those joining us today, many of whom are subscribers to give us this day, um, have come to appreciate your short biographies of so many saints, some canonized, some not, included in each issue. So today you have selected seven saintly witnesses whose stories are sure to inspire us as we journey through Lent to Easter. Um, so if you'd like, please introduce us to our first saintly witness. Thank you very much, uh, Heidi. And uh, thanks as always to give us this day in liturgical press for giving me this opportunity over many years, 12 years now that I've been writing these daily reflections, Blessed Among Us. Uh, today, as you say, I've been asked to speak about saintly guides uh, through Lent and Easter, which is to say uh, figures whose memorials uh, fall within this season. They did not choose the season of their deaths. But as I reflected on this group, as I did previously with uh, Saints of Advent, I realized that each of them in some way does speak to the spirit of the Lenten season. For all of us, to be a Christian is an ongoing process of conversion of learning to see our lives in relation to the pattern of Christ's life. All saints and holy people have embraced this vocation in the saintly guides I've chosen for today. I would like to reflect on the particular ways that they've responded to this calling. I'm going to uh, share my screen now, and I hope it works. <laughs> and I'm gonna put on the... Uh, slideshow. Oh, come on. Um, have a little problem here. There we go. Uh, I hope you can see that all right. If you can't, I won't know. I'd like to uh, start. These are some of the people I'll be talking about, but I'm going to be starting with the extraordinary story of Saints Perpetua and Felicity, Christian martyrs who died in Carthage around the year 203. Their feast day falls on March 6th. It's worth remembering that the cult of the saints had its origins in the commemoration of martyrs. In the early church, the willingness to lay down one's life for the sake of the gospel became a particular sign and proof of authentic discipleship. The martyrs were seen as reenacting the passion of Christ and thereby bearing witness to their faith in the resurrection. The church venerated the stories of such witnesses, preserving their relics and memorializing the anniversaries of their deaths. During an era of persecution, the blood of martyrs, as one of the church fathers said, became the seed of the church. Among these early martyrs, there are many stories of women remembered as the so-called virgin martyrs, such as Agnes, Cecilia, Catherine of Alexandria. By and large, their stories follow a similar pattern, a Christian woman living during a time of Roman persecution, cites her espousal to Christ as the reason for her refusal to marry or worship idols. 
in retaliation, she's typically subjected to hideous tortures. Her resistance is taken not just as an affront to the Roman gods, but as an attack on the very order of patriarchy itself. These women are traditionally held up as paragons of sexual purity. But when we read their stories through a gospel lens, I think we discover a different motif, one that connects them with a line of holy women that extends to our own time. The opposition in these stories is not between sex and holiness. Rather, it lies in a conflict between a young woman's power in Christ to define her own identity versus a patriarchal culture's claim to identify her in terms of her gender or sexuality. The power of such liberated women is prominently highlighted in the passion of Saints Perpetua and Felicity. This poignant narrative, most of it written in the voice of Perpetua herself, was one of the most popular texts of the early church, apparently in some places even competing with scripture. It recounts the story of Perpetua, a prosperous young woman of second century Carthage, who at the age of 22 was arrested along with her servant Felicity for violating a prohibition against conversion to Christianity. This narrative stands apart from many others because Perpetua and Felicity are definitely not virgins. Perpetua is the mother of a nursing infant, while Felicity is eight months pregnant at the time of their arrest. It's a strikingly personal document filled with painfully intimate details, free of the usual stereotypical conventions of later hagiography. Perpetua emerges as a fully realized person, subject to hunger, fears, and even as a nursing mother separated from her child, the pain of swollen breasts. The last detail points to a fact that this is not the disembodied voice of a generic Christian, but of a Christian woman. The modern reader can hardly ignore the pervasive significance of gender. Throughout, we sense the struggle of two women to claim their own identities and vocation amidst the various competing claims imposed by society. Even at their trial, their judge appeals to Perpetua's sense of duty toward her aged father and her infant son. Perpetua answers the court with a simple declaration, I am a Christian. One senses that in Christ, she has found the power and freedom to name herself and the courage to accept the consequences. And yet there's no suggestion that Perpetua scorns motherhood or the bonds of family. The narrative describes in touching detail the suffering caused by her separation from her infant son. But when he is restored to her and she's able to nurse him, quote, straight away, I became well and was lightened of my labor and care for the child. And suddenly the prison was made a palace for me so that I would sooner be here than anywhere else. Her servant Felicity feared that because of her advanced pregnancy, she would be separated from her companions. But after a night of ardent prayer, she goes into labor and gives birth to a daughter whom she's able to entrust, along with perpetuous son, to Christian friends. On their last day, the prisoners are marched from the darkness of the prison into the glaring amphitheater, quote, as it were to heaven, cheerful and bright of countenance. Perpetua wears the expression of a true spouse of Christ, while Felicity, rejoicing that her child is born in safety, came now from blood to blood, quote, from the midwife to the gladiator, to wash after her labor in a second baptism. In the arena together, the two women are stripped and exposed to wild beasts before the executioner is ordered to put them to the sword. There's a final poignant image. The narrator who completes the text notes that before meeting the sword on this day of their victory, the two young women, formerly mistress and servant, now sisters in Christ, turn to one another before the jeering crowd and exchanged a kiss. The time of martyrs did not end in the Roman era. There are those in every age who have borne witness to eternal values of truth, love, and justice, even to the laying down of their lives. In a modern context, the story of Hans and Sophie Scholl, brother and sister, and their comrades in the White Rose resistance to Hitler, 
bring to mind the story of Perpetua and Felicity and so many of the early martyrs who stood up against the cruel and idolatrous claims of an absolute state. This picture, incidentally, is a still from the uh, excellent movie called Sophie Scholl. The White Rose was a circle of young people in Germany, mostly students, who had been inspired by Christian faith and the uncorrupted idealism of youth to challenge the tyranny of the Nazi regime. At the center of the group were a brother and sister, Hans and Sophie Scholl, only 24 and 21 years old. Hans was a medical student who had served on the Russian front. Sophie studied philosophy. Discerning with uncommon depth, the clarity, excuse me, the depth of Nazi depravity, they decided to wage a spiritual war against the system, armed with no other weapons than courage, the power of truth, and an illegal duplicating machine. Their strategy was simple. At the least, they hoped to shatter the illusion of unanimous consent and to defy the Nazis' claim to omnipotence. Beyond that, they dared hope that pro proclaiming the truth, they might break the spell in which all Germany was enthralled and inspire those with doubts to move toward active resistance. In the summer and fall of 1942, they began circulating a series of leaflets in Munich and other cities. The leaflets were mailed randomly or left on park benches or empty bus stops. Signed anonymously by the White Rose, they contained a sweeping indictment of the Nazi regime and a call on readers to work for the defeat of their own nation. Hans and Sophie were devout Christians. They believed that the struggle against Hitler was a battle for the soul of Germany, and thus a duty for all Christians. As they wrote in one leaflet, we must attack evil where it is strongest, and it is strongest in the power of Hitler. We will not be silent. We are your bad conscience. The white rose will not leave you in peace. Their efforts threw the Gestapo into a frantic effort to discover the perpetrators. Emboldened by the furor caused by their leaflets, members of the White Rose began to take more reckless steps. On February 18, 1943, Hans and Sophie were caught distributing leaflets outside a university lecture hall. They tried at first to confess to all the actions of the White Rose, hoping to spare their comrades, but the Gestapo eventually captured them all. Hans and Sophie were quickly convicted of treason and sentenced to death. Like St. Perpetua, they were beheaded on February 22nd. There's a, um, a film called Downfall that depicts uh, the last days of Hitler in his bunker in Berlin and is told through the eyes of his secretary. And at the end, they interview now the aged uh, secretary. She was a young young woman at the time many decades later. And she said, you know, when I found out all about the depravities of the Nazis, I was I was horrified by what I had been a part of. But I thought, well, I had no way of, of knowing about these things. And she said, and then I heard the story of Sophie Scholl. And I realized that she was the same age as me. Sophie wrote, life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets lead to the same place as wide avenues. And a little candle burns itself out just like a flaming torch does. I choose my own way to burn. Choosing one's own way to burn, Sophie's words, is not about choosing death, but about asserting a kind of freedom that defies the power of death. Choosing to make of one's own life a witness to human values, to the ultimate power of love in a time of darkness. Traditionally, the title of martyr has referred to those who died in so-called odium fide, hatred of the faith. And that is described not only the early Roman martyrs, but others in later centuries who were killed by enemies of the Christian faith, or in the case of Jesuits in Elizabethan England, hatred of Catholicism. But Pope Francis has steadily enlarged the understanding of martyrdom to include those who were killed because of their faithfulness to the gospel, the message of justice and solidarity, or who lay down their lives in love of their neighbor, or even in their care for creation. Father Engelmar Unzeitig, who died on 
March 2nd, 1945 would be an example of such a martyr. Growing up in Germany, Engelmar dreamed of becoming a missionary priest, but his ordination in 1939 occurred just weeks before the outbreak of World War II, and that would change his plans. Within two years, he was arrested by the Gestapo for making, quote, insidious expressions and for defending the Jews in his sermons. In June 1941, he was conveyed to the concentration camp in Dachau. Dachau was originally established to house political prisoners, but during the war, the population of the camp swelled to 200,000 inmates from 40 countries. These included an unusual number of priests and other clergy, nearly 3,000, which made Dachau, they said, the largest monastery in the world. These uh, prisoners were held in special contempt by the SS and housed in their own quarter known as the priest barracks. There, amid the filth, degradation, starvation, and atmosphere of death, the priests and pastors pursued their ministry. They prayed together, Catholics and Protestants. They celebrated clandestine services and tried to be of pastoral service to their fellow prisoners. For the newly ordained Father Engelmar, Dachau was virtually the only posting he'd experienced as a priest. He tried to regard it as a school of holiness, befriending and comforting fellow prisoners, often sharing his own meager rations, pouring himself out in endless service. He survived for nearly four years in the camp, four years of famine, when grass and weeds were a coveted meal, years of backbreaking work, arbitrary beatings, epidemics, and freezing exposure. He survived all this and most likely would have survived the war had it not been for a terrible outbreak of typhoid in the camp in the winter of 1945. Those who were infected were confined to a special barracks where they were left to die in horrific squalor with no one to tend for them. A call went out for volunteer orderlies. 20 priests stepped forward, Father Engelmar among them. The meaning of this gesture was clear to all. The priest volunteers entered the quarantine barracks with no expectation of returning. Conditions were appalling. Disease carrying lice and fleas were everywhere. The sick lying in their own filth. Within the hell of Dachau, this was surely the inner sanctum. Yet into this void, the priests brought their love and faith, making the best of the weeks that were available to them to bring some order and dignity to the place. The SS would not enter the barracks, and so there was probably no other place in the camp where the priests were so free to exercise their faith. Here at last was the mission to which Engelmar had consecrated himself. Of the 20 priest volunteers, only two survived. He was not among them. Within six weeks, he was burning with fever. He died on March 2nd, 1945, only a few weeks before the liberation of the camp. In a letter written days before his death, he wrote, The good is undying, and victory must remain with God, even if it sometimes seems useless for us to spread love in the world. Nevertheless, one sees again and again that the human heart is attuned to love and it cannot withstand its power in the long run if it is truly based on God and not on creatures. We want to continue to do and offer everything so that love and peace may soon reign again. St. Oscar Romero might be the quintessential saint for Lent, one whose life so deeply traces the pattern of Christ's passion, the good shepherd who laid down his life for his flock. Following his selection as Archbishop of San Salvador in 1977, his public ministry, like that of Jesus, lasted only three years. His selection initially delighted the country's oligarchs. He was known as a pious and relatively conservative bishop with nothing to suggest he was a man to challenge the status quo. No one would have predicted that in three short years he would be known as the embodiment of the prophetic church, a voice for the voiceless, that he would earn the scorn of the rich and powerful and be targeted for assassination. 
During the course of those three years, he underwent a kind of conversion, steadily emptying himself of all status and privilege to identify with the cause of the poor and prepare himself to face the consequences. As he said, <clears throat> one who is committed to the poor must risk the same fate as the poor. And in El Salvador, we know what that fate of the poor signifies, to disappear, to be tortured, to be captive, to be found dead. The question was not if he would meet that fate, but when. As it turned out, there was a fitting, even priestly dimension to his sacrifice. Shot at the altar on March 24th, 1980, while saying Mass. I took these pictures uh, of that chapel in San Salvador when I went there uh, for uh, the celebration of his beatification uh, some years ago. Um, on the left is the, the altar where he was shot. And on the right is a picture from the altar where you can see all the way down to the entrance of the church where the sniper who shot him had to be standing in clear view. His death followed on the day after he had appealed to members of the military to refuse illegal orders. I beseech you, I beg you, I command you, stop the aggression. The church in El Salvador was not the first to suffer persecution. The anomaly was that here the persecutors dared to call themselves Christians. Their victims did not die simply for clinging to the faith, but for clinging like Jesus to the poor. It was this insight that marked a new theological depth in Romero's message. For him, the church's option for the poor was not just a matter of pastoral priorities. It was a defining characteristic of Christian faith. Quote, a church that does not unite itself to the poor in order to denounce from the place of the poor the injustice committed against them is not truly the church of Jesus Christ. We either believe in a God of life or we serve the idols of death. In that opposition between the God of life and the idols of death, Romero drew a clear line from the witness of the early Christian martyrs. And yet it took a long time for Romero to be recognized as a martyr. For many years, his cause was blocked by powerful prelates who claim he didn't die for his faith, but for mixing himself in, up in politics. This charge was answered by the postulator of, Romans, of Romero's cause, who said of his assassination, it was not caused by motives that were simply political, but by hatred for a faith that imbued with charity would not be silent in the face of the injustices that relentlessly and cruelly slaughtered the poor and their defenders. Romero's canonization in 2018 did not simply enlarge the church's understanding of martyrdom. He offered a powerful example of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in a world marked by violence and injustice. While many saints have exemplified a model of holiness in the form of escape from a sinful world, Romero's holiness was expressed in solidarity with a wounded world. Many saints practice charity, but Romero combined charity with a passion for justice. He answered the call for holy witnesses, excuse me, who are faithful to the end, who enlarge both the church and the world, and who are willing to speak the truth and pay up personally. And in the end, like many other martyrs, he offered not only the witness of his death, but also his hope in the resurrection. In that sense, too, he is the consummate saint for Lent and Easter. In an interview two weeks before his assassination, he said, I have frequently been threatened with death. I must say that as a Christian, I do not believe in death, but in the resurrection. If they kill me, I shall rise again in the Salvadoran people. A bishop will die, but the church of God, the people, will never die. Viola Liuzzo, who died on March 25th, 1965, is quite a different kind of witness than St. Oscar Romero or the typical martyrs remembered by the church. But perhaps for that reason, she's someone we can more easily identify with. 
She was a 39-year-old mother of five, the wife of a union official in Detroit. In March 1965, she heard on television that Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders in Selma, Alabama, had issued a call for volunteers to help with a march from Selma to Montgomery to defend Black voting rights. She decided to answer that call. Selma at the time had become the site of one of the great campaigns of the civil rights struggle, a place where white supremacists had drawn a line. In February 1965, a march from Selma to the state capitol was blocked on the Edmund Pettus Bridge by a phalanx of state troopers who rushed into the crowd, wildly swinging their clubs and whips and almost killing John Lewis, later a U.S. congressman. The day would be remembered as Bloody Sunday. The new march, scheduled for March 21st, would proceed under the protection of the National Guard, but no one knew what kind of risks might be involved. Viola herself had known personal struggle, pulling herself out of the poverty of her childhood and confronting a number of painful dead ends. Leaving school after her 10th grade, she was twice married and divorced by the time she was 25. But with her marriage in 1950 to Jim Liuza, an official with the Teamsters Union and her conversion to Catholicism, her life had taken on a steadily deeper focus. She had completed evening courses in career training and had enrolled in part-time studies in college. Friends recalled her as a person of boundless energy and generosity, always seeking ways to be helpful. They also teased her for her indignation over social injustice. One of the Northern ministers who organized the effort in Selma remembered her as an ordinary person, yet she impressed him as someone prepared to take a risk for what she believed in. She was a person seeking the truth, he said, searching, quote, for the manifestation of God in a broad rather than in a narrow way. As she said, it's everybody's fight. There are too many people who just stand around talking. Fearing that her family would try to dissuade her, she didn't tell anyone in advance of her plans. Instead, she set off from Detroit in her Oldsmobile sedan and called her family from the road, begging them to understand that this was something she had to do. They never saw her again. The march was a great success, ending peacefully with speeches by Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, who thrilled the crowd with the vision of the coming day of freedom. How long will it take? Not long, because truth pressed to earth will rise again. But that night, as Viola was ferrying a young black civil rights worker, Leroy Moten, on the road back to Selma, a car full of Klansmen sped up beside them and fired a fusillade of bullets into her car. Viola was killed instantly. I think of Viola, along with so many other saints, who felt at some point that God was calling them to some mission, some higher purpose, to drop their nets and come follow him. When Jesus issued that call to fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, he didn't tell the whole story of the risk this might involve, becoming fishers of people, which apparently sounded better than being fishers of fish. He did that only gradually along the way, and even then the disciples didn't believe it. And right up to the end, they kept asking him about what honors they would enjoy when he came into his glory. Viola heard and responded to that call. She didn't know when she got into her Oldsmobile to drive to Selma, Alabama, that Jesus was calling her to Calvary and to his glory, or that her sacrifice and the blood that people spilled on the Edmund Pettus Bridge would help prepare the way for the advancement of civil rights, the passage of the Voting Rights Act, progress toward a society where people would not be oppressed because of the color of their skin. But the long path to freedom, justice, and the beloved community, just like the vocational call that each of us receives, is never over, not when we get married or enter a monastery or give up our nets or begin that long drive. It's always a call to go deeper. And that journey for this country and our church and for each one of us continues. Sister Thea Bowman, who died on March 30th, 1990, is someone who embodied that journey for our country and for our church. 
Sister Thea was one of the great treasures of the American Catholic Church. As a Franciscan sister, she managed to integrate the resources of her Catholic faith with her identity as an African-American woman, ablaze with the spirit of love, the memory of struggle, and a faith in God's promises. She impressed her audiences not just with her message, but with the nobility of her spirit. No one who encountered her could fail to catch a measure of her joy and gratitude for the gift of life. She was a particular inspiration to the Black Catholic community, helping them to claim their pride of place among the people of God, while also encouraging them to enrich the wider church with the gifts of their distinctive culture and spirituality. Born, born Bertha Bowman in rural Mississippi in 1937, she converted to Catholicism while attending parochial school. At the age of 16, she surprised her family by entering the convent of the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, taking the name Sister Thea. She found herself the only African-American in a white religious order, but she had no desire to blend in. She believed her identity as a black woman entailed a special vocation. She believed the church must make room for the spiritual traditions of African-Americans including the memory of slavery, but also the spirit of hope and resistance reflected in the spirituals, the importance of family, community, celebration, and remembrance. What does it mean to be Black and Catholic, she asked. It means I come to my church fully functioning. I bring myself, my Black self, all that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to become. She was a spellbinding speaker who preached the gospel to audiences across the land, including the U.S. bishops. After being diagnosed with incurable cancer, she bore a different kind of witness. She continued to travel and speak even from her wheelchair. With her bright African robes and her now bald head, she was as always a striking figure, but now when she sang the spiritual Sometimes I feel like a motherless child, a long way from home. Her audience detected an even more personal and poignant confession of faith. The faith that had sustained the slaves, the hope expressed in the spirituals, the love embodied by St. Francis, now sustained her in her personal way of the cross. And to her other gifts to the church, she now added the witness of her courage and trust in God. She said, when I first found out I had cancer, I didn't know what to pray for. I didn't know if I should pray for healing or life or death. Then I found peace in praying for what my folks call God's perfect will. As it evolved, my prayer has become, Lord, let me live until I die. By that, I mean, I want to live love, and serve fully until death comes. If that prayer is answered, how long really doesn't matter. Thea Bowman died on March 30th, 1990, at the age of 52. Her cause for canonization has been uh, initiated. She is, he is now a servant of God. Thea Bowman's reminder to us in Lent is that Bearing witness does not have to mean martyrdom in some version of the Roman amphitheater. We are not called to seek suffering or even to make sense of suffering. As Thea said, I don't try to make sense of suffering. I try to make sense of life. I try each day to see God's will, to live, love, and serve fully until death comes. I think of that message in the final witness I'd like to mention today, maybe the most unlikely. <laughs> That's Fred Rogers, otherwise well known as Mr. Rogers. Remember that Jesus defined his message in a twofold command to love God with our whole heart, mind, and soul, and the second, like unto it, that we love our neighbor as ourselves. That caused the the lawyer questioning Jesus to ask, 
who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied by sharing the parable of the Good Samaritan. Fred Rogers replied by creating Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. The inspiration for his program on public television came one day as he watched children's programming on Saturday morning and was appalled to see that it was filled with pranks, pratfalls, and violence. He conceived of a new mission to plant seeds of a different world in the hearts of children. The formula for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood changed very little from its first broadcast in 1968 until its last in 2001. It invariably began with Fred Rogers slipping into a zippered cardigan sweater and a comfortable pair of sneakers as he sang, sang his theme song, which you all know. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? For over 30 years, before an audience of many generations of young children, Mr. Rogers conducted an ongoing seminar on kindness, gratitude, and the wonder of life. He might welcome famous musicians to talk about their creative work or visit a factory to see how things are made. He often addressed hard topics, suffering, death, the divorce of parents, the pain of being bullied. He taught that it was okay and normal sometimes to feel sad and lonely and how bad feelings were easier to handle if you could share them with someone. He showed that people come in all colors and shapes, that some have special gifts, while others struggle with disabilities, but that everyone is special and worthy of love for being just who they are. Though ordained as a Presbyterian minister, Rogers pursued a unique type of ministry in children's television, spreading a message of love, gentleness, and the joy of helping others. He rarely spoke about his faith, believing that it was more important to teach through example you don't need to speak overtly about religion in order to get a message across, he said. His own reputation for kindness was legendary. People often stopped to tell him how much his program had helped them in a difficult moment. In every encounter, he devoted his full attention, imparting the conviction that each person and each moment in life is precious. Listening is where love begins, he said. Listening to ourselves and then to our neighbor. Fred Rogers was diagnosed with stomach cancer in October 2002. He died four months later on February 27, 2003. And that's where I'd like to leave this reflection on saintly guides of Lanton, a reminder that this season is not about some kind of grim-faced struggle to do without sweets, counting the days until Easter, but to enter intentionally into a journey in which we expand our capacity to love God and to love our neighbors. In a world of hatred and injustice, there may be a cost to that kind of love. But the arena of holiness is not just in a Roman Colosseum or a prison camp. It's in our moment in history, in our ordinary lives, in our encounter with our neighbors, not just in our immediate neighborhood, that journey and encounter does not end on Easter. It continues every day. May we continue to remember and recognize the saints who accompany us along the way. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Robert. I wanna remind everybody who's, who's listened and participating here that you can just ask questions down in the Q&A there. We have a few coming in. Um, one question just at the end here that someone asked about uh, Fred Rogers. Um, what do you think, just, you know, thinking, uh, what, you know, just from your perspective, what do you think Fred Rogers might think of today's social media, other forms of media, because he worked through television? Um, do you think he might have embraced, you know, some of the other forms of media? I don't know. Whether he, well, I think he would have been acutely aware of the opportunities that uh, media like that uh, create and makes everybody possible to share their own lives with, with others. Uh, it brings the lives of others uh, closely uh, to us all around the world and down the street, our families, a ways of staying in touch and communicating and expressing ourselves. Um, but I think, uh, like Pope Francis, he would be 
also very, very concerned about the uh, kind of toxic uh, poisons that it has introduced into our, our culture, uh, the opportunities, the greater opportunities for, for bullying and harassment and trolling, uh, the ways that people seem to try to uh, just uh, make people angry uh, in order to get uh, more clicks, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so I know I have you know friends who have just literally been driven off of Twitter X or whatever we call it uh, because they feel that it just a kind of an open door uh, to uh, to abuse and uh, you know I haven't experienced that personally so much myself maybe maybe I'm doing something wrong I'm not uh, taking enough you know hard uh, positions or something but you know I share a lot of stories about saints I share a lot of pictures of flowers and trees and things like that uh, share interviews with some of my authors. Uh, call attention to other media that I think uh, people would like to see. And so uh, for me, uh, it's become a deep kind of form of communication, or as you might, as Fred Rogers might call it, ministry. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely believe that that it's something that we have to be very careful about. Thank you. There is a question here. How were Perpetua and Felicity, back to the beginning, Perpetua and Felicity able to have Christian friends care for their children? When Christianity was outlawed, a good question. Um, I I don't know why they were singled out. You know, in some way, per Felicity maybe because she remained loyal to Perpetua, her her mistress. I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether I. You know, evidently Perpetua was a uh, a woman of some status. Although it's interesting that the story uh, makes no mention of her husband, only her father and uh, and her baby. Uh, we don't know her circumstances, uh, but I would imagine she was a kind of prominent person. Now, there were other people uh, also in prison with them at the time, uh, and it's possible that uh, people were able to keep their faith a little bit more on the down low or something, uh, and uh, you know, it wasn't like they were going after everybody. So uh, uh, the interesting thing about this is 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 that unlike the other kind of narratives of of uh, Virgin martyrs and whatnot. The story is uh, purports to be written by Perpetua herself, telling her story and recounting her experience in prison right up until the moment of of you know their being executed, where it says now someone else takes over this uh, this narrative, uh, and so we know it, you know the, the, how it ends. Um, but uh, no, it's an interesting question, and as I said, uh, it, it's a it's a fantastically moving uh, document. So many of the other stories of of the martyrs sound very stereotypical hagiography, hey, uh, and the people you know never have any doubts and they're they're impervious to pain and they have no fears and all this kind of thing. And Perpetua writes a lot about you know fears. She she has a dream at night where angel kind of speaks to her and she says is is death painful you know, uh, and they said the, the answer comes it's a brief pain. Um, and uh, you, you know, just really sharing very, very vivid kind of personal details about about the ex ex experience of being in, in in prison and facing terrible fate. To be there, there was really nothing worse than being, uh, uh, you know, exposed to wild beasts. This would be like wild ox and 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 uh, leopards and tigers and things like that. Um, but uh, it's uh, so it was it was one of the really popular documents of the early church that was very, very widely read and known. Thank you. There's another question here. How is the pay, how is the pipeline of saint recognition enlarging beyond the Western world of Europe and the Americas? Well, it really uh, opened up widely during the the. Uh, papacy of John Paul II. He, he uh, beatified and canonized as many saints as probably all of previous <laughs> history of the church. Uh, he was a dynamo of saint making. And of course, he was the first uh, pope who traveled all over the world. Uh, and he was very uh, proactive in seeking uh, stories of people from the local churches uh, to, to, to highlight uh, I, I write about some of these people, of course, in Blessed Among Us, but uh, many from Africa, Asia, Latin America, Oceania, uh, uh, indigenous uh, peoples, uh, and uh, 
but of course, uh, still, still, uh, the, a lot of founders of religious orders in Italy uh, or Poland, uh, uh, they they seemed <laughs> they had a, a kind of an inside track somehow. Anyway, um, still uh, relatively, you know, it's a long, long, slow process too. You know, so in the olden days, of course, it could take centuries for someone to be officially canonized. Now the whole process has been streamlined, uh, you know, quite a lot. Uh, but as you know, there are half a dozen African Americans uh, who are still in the beginning stages of of, of this process uh, in the United States, um, and there. Um, but uh, but you know, there there there's certainly many more uh, witnesses or servants of God who who reflect the kind of uh, global church uh, than than you would have had a hundred years ago or fifty years ago. Thank you. So there's a question here about identity. Is identity something, do you think, that links all of the people you talked about today? Did, are they made of different stuff than us? <laughs> like that they could do, you know, that they could face what they faced and, and suffer the way they suffered? And it, was there something about who they are um, that was unique, do you think? Well, um, people who are... Who are <laughs> martyrs uh or even those who are are go through the whole process of canonization are 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 typically people who have you might say gone all the way uh they have uh, taken uh, their baptismal vows extremely seriously uh they felt uh, a vocation to uh, to uh, really embody and uh, live by the by the you know, beatitudes and the gospel uh, challenge um, and I would say, uh, yes, I think that that you know people who who are prepared to suffer torture and 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 lay down their lives in that way are exceptional people. Um, and I would not you know want to suggest that that they are the only real Christians. I mean, there was an early Christian uh, Saint Ignatius of of Antioch, you know who who really wanted to be a martyr he said you know now uh, uh uh now i'm becoming now i'm becoming a christian what he meant by that was that the to show your willingness to follow the way of the gospel all the way to the cross all the way to calvary uh in imitation of jesus who said that those who follow me will also be persecuted and also face uh and i have to carry their own cross uh was you know, was considered uh the a kind of uh, to exemplify uh, what it meant to be a saint. And for that reason, you know, the fact that the saints tended to be such exceptional people uh, gave the impression that, well, that saints are are just different kinds of people. They're not, not like us. Uh, uh, and I think that is something that actually has, has been counterproductive. And the church has tried to back off a little bit and say, well, wait, wait a second. These, these are, these saints have been canonized but that they're not the only saints. Uh, we're all called to be saints in our own way, uh, and that is a process. It's not something like, um, you know, you check off all these boxes and then you're done. Okay, now I guess I will just say ten percent more and I'll be a saint. Something like that. It's an ongoing journey, which is a constant turning toward and conversion, and uh, you know, turning toward God uh, and trying to uh, match that in our behavior in our own lives. Uh, so all of the people that we call saints started somewhere as people you wouldn't say, wow, I'm not like that. That's a completely different person. You know, Mother Teresa was indistinguishable from uh, thousands of other nuns, even in her own order uh, as a school teacher in India for, for decades until she felt this call to go further. You know, uh, Oscar Romero was a bishop for, you know, whole you know, many years. Uh, until he became Archbishop of San Salvador, and he felt this uh, this kind of particular sort of challenge. Uh, so it's it's really not a matter of how far we 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 go. And some people go all the way, you could say, or go to a place where we can't imagine following. Um, and others, maybe you know, the fact that she died, Viola uh, Liuzzo makes her uh, a martyr. But she's one of countless people who during the civil rights time, thought that uh, something had to be done. A lot of people are talking about it, but they're not doing anything. Uh, and they realized that there was risk involved. She was not the only person who died during that Selma weekend. 
Um, and she, um, she decided, you know, she was going to do this. So many of the saints are people who you could say were very ordinary people. And they felt some kind of call that told them there was more to life than this. And they wanted more. Uh, and whether that came from a voice from God or in their prayer or uh, some kind of sign that, that pointed them in the direction of, of, of the next step, step to go farther. So I would say, you know, are we, are these exceptional people? Yes, Dorothy Day is an exceptional person, but in many ways, an ordinary person. Uh, you know, Oscar Romero, uh, in many ways, a very ordinary person, very extraordinary circumstances. And it's not so much that he chose this as he chose not to run from it. He chose to accept it, uh, whatever, whatever would follow. And I've known lots of people that, like that in, in my life. And, um, uh, they're the people who have really inspired me, uh, you know, the, the most. And if we think of the people, the saints, as well, I, I couldn't do that. I'm no saint. That's exactly why Dorothy Day didn't like to be called a saint. She said, I don't mm. want to be dismissed that easily. It made it sound like what she did came easily for her because she was such a holy person. Uh, but she was somebody who took one step after another and stayed with it and didn't back down. Thank you. That's just a wonderful explanation and a great reminder for all of us in Lent as we're in the season of Lent here. Um, there's a couple questions from, from people who are new to Catholicism and wondering if you could just briefly go over the basics of the levels of how you become a canonized saint in the church. In the early days, uh, it was more a matter of acclamation by the local church. And as I said, the origin of that came from the stories of the martyrs who were uh, had 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 you know, followed Christ and the gospel in this heroic kind of way. And there were a lot of martyrs back then. Uh, but after the age of the martyrs, it was realized that there were lots of other ways of giving your life totally, whether to the poor or a life of asceticism in a, in a desert, you know, uh, cave or as a monastic or as a missionary or as a uh, serving the poor, all the kinds of things like that. And different models of, of holiness uh, emerged, and they would uh, mostly be kind of recognized locally, and their reputation might spread because their stories were told and repeated. In the Middle Ages, it became more formalized, uh, and the Vatican took uh, control or responsibility for officially naming saints, partly to avoid a kind of over-credulity uh, about uh, some of the miraculous kind of tales that were were, were told, and and to curb the uh, you know financial incentives there might be in a local town or something like that to have a saint who would draw pilgrims or whatever. Um, so it it could often take a very very long time, and was a huge uh, process. You'd have the devil's advocates, both so called, who would argue against it, and it would be like a trial. John Paul II streamlined all of this a lot, and he took a more historical uh, approach, which is to show how a person in the whole totality of their life were in the context of their time and history and their own personalities and all that sort of thing, their biography. It was more of a biographical approach that told the story of a person who was being called uh, to follow Christ more heroically. Now, it's gone through other you know, modifications since then, but basically it begins with a local church let's say in New York, in the case of Dorothy Day, I've been involved in that. Uh, she's from New York. The archdiocese uh, petitions the Vatican to open her cause and makes a kind of prima facie case for why she's you know, worthy of this. There's a lot of interest in her life and uh, and uh, seems to have lived a holy life. The Vatican looks at that and says, okay, uh, that's approved uh, to open that process. And she's then he or she called a servant of God. At that point, they are a big process of documentation that has to be compiled, interviews with people who knew them, theologians to scrutinize all of their writings. All of this material then gets sent to Rome, where uh, it goes to a congregation that's dedicated to looking at saints. And if the uh, they evaluate all this and say yes, uh, uh, they they approve. It gets they recommend to the Pope uh, that he recognize their life of heroic virtue, and they're then called venerable. Uh, then the real action begins. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but uh, to be beatified, which is the next stage, requires the certification of a of, a, of an acknowledged certified miracle uh, that's waived in the case of a martyr. Um, but otherwise, you need a miracle. And when that has been approved, you need a second miracle then to be called a saint. Um, so you've got servant of God, venerable, uh, blessed, 
uh, and then Saint, basically the process. Thank Should you. Thank you so much, Robert. I think we're out of time. I'm going to have a couple ending announcements here, but through the chat and the Q&A and hearing from people, everyone is just so grateful for your time and sharing your wisdom here today. Thank you so, so much. It's it's a um, a reminder for all of us and how we are called to to live this Lent and follow Christ and try to go all in if we can, as ordinary people as we are. So thank you all for joining us today. An email with a link to this recording of our conversation will be sent to all who registered um, within the next few days. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Robert writes short biographies of saintly witnesses six days a week in Give Us This Day. If you'd like to know more about Give Us This Day, please visit gutd.net. And as an added timely treat, I just want to mention this really quick. Um, the organization Sober St. Patrick's Day has created a short video on the life of St. Patrick with, you know, with Sunday being St. Patrick's Day, um, using Robert's biography of St. Patrick. Uh, so you may view it at Sober St. Patrick, Sober St. Patrick's Day dot org. That's a mouthful. Um, but we'll include a link to that video in the email with a link to the recording of this conversation as well. So thanks for, to everyone for joining us. We hope that these saintly witnesses have provided some inspiration and courage as we journey together uh, with Christ to the cross and we join in the celebration of his resurrection coming at Easter. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.